Granada, the word in Spanish means pomegranate, a fruit brought here by Muslim tribes from North Africa in the 8th century. They were known as the Moors, and they came to Europe from what is now known as Morocco. Morocco, like Japan, is one of the states that survives. And their royal family is directly traced in a bloodline back to the Prophet Muhammad. For nearly 800 years, the Moors ruled in Granada, and for nearly as long in a wider territory of what became known as Moorish Spain, El Andalus. It's critical that all the dynasties got their great respect from what they could do in Spain. In Granada, where the Moors first came in 711, they built a fortress palace, the Alhambra. It was never conquered by their enemies, but in 1492, the Moors surrendered their citadel. By then, the last outpost of Moorish Spain to the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabel. It would bring to the end an era and mark the beginnings of the Spanish Inquisition. But much of what the Moors built survived and can still be visited today. The dynasties are everything. All built architecture, all the great monuments, all the battles tie in with the dynasties. In this episode, we explore the rich architectural legacy of the Moors, the dynasties that built an empire and what they left behind. On a hill overlooking the Moroccan capital, Rabat, stands an ancient site that charts the birth of a nation. Only the giant storks nesting atop its ruins and ancient minaret populate the site today. But over the centuries, Chella, as it's known, was occupied by Carthaginians and then Romans, but more recently in the 14th century by Islamic sultans who erected a mosque, walls and a necropolis where they buried their own. The imperial journey that would establish Morocco's 1,300-year history of unbroken dynastic rule would begin just 100 miles away, more than 1,000 years earlier. Volubilis, previously part of the North African Carthaginian Empire, became part of the Roman Empire after Juba II, a local Berber king, married the daughter of Anthony and Cleopatra. Thought to have been constructed in the second and third centuries during the reign of Emperor Caligula, it was buried by an earthquake in 1755 and wasn't discovered again until 1915. Volubilis grew from a provincial outpost to a substantial capital on the outskirts of an empire known as Roman Mauritania. It was important enough to have its own triumphal arch, the Gate of Tangier. It also contained small palaces and substantial houses with exquisite mosaic floors still here today. Arabs invaded Morocco in 683, inspired to spread their new religion, Islam. In 786, Arab leader Idris I, who claimed direct descent from the prophet Muhammad, arrived in Volubilis. It marked the end of the Roman city. The local Berber tribes converted from Christianity, and Idris I was buried here in a hilltop town of Moulay Idris, just three kilometers away. It's still regarded as one of Morocco's most holy sites. The Moorish civilization is so dazzling, seemed to come from nowhere. And when we dig further, it gets even more mysterious. We know that it took two generations for the Arab armies to conquer North Africa. 
Then a small force of Arab and Berber warriors embarked on a series of raids across the Strait of Gibraltar into southern Spain. Tariq ibn Zayad leads an army of no more than 7,000 Berber soldiers serving as recently converted Muslims on a raid into Spain. He conquers the whole of the Visigothic Kingdom. No one is expecting it. They were seen as liberators. The great Jewish communities in the city of Spain and the Catholics welcomed the Berber Muslims as liberators from the unpopular Visigothic Aryan rulers that they'd been under for centuries. No one thinks that more than 60,000 Berbers and Arabs, almost certainly all men, ever migrated to make Muslim Spain. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a small, tiny percentage. It's, it's like the Norman Knights um, taking England in 1066, and perhaps that's the best parallel. So rapid was the Moors' expansion that soon a capital was established in the city of Cordoba. Prince Andal Rahman escaped here with his family after the fall of the Umayyad dynasty in Damascus in 725 and its replacement by the Baghdad-based Abbasid dynasty. Not surprisingly, the centerpiece of his new caliphate, the Mesquita Mosque, which he began building here on the site of a church 30 years after his arrival, combined indigenous designs with those that borrowed features from the Great Mosque of Damascus. The Great Mosque of Cordoba is dazzling. When you go in there for the first time, you're lost in a forest, like a sort of, it was equated earlier on with a, with a palm orchard of Syria. Outside, it's a very humble exterior wall. But inside, you've got this row upon rows of arches, double arches, and this extraordinary gilded mirror which is the direction of prayer, with this sort of backlit sort of glow of gold behind, and this extraordinary bell tower. It was not composed by one man. In fact, we know that four great rulers all added, each one, as it were, doubling the mosque each time to show their power. The extraordinary fact that most visitors stumble upon is that there's a cathedral embedded inside now. For nearly 500 years, and in particular during the 10th century, Cordoba was a beacon of civilization, a cultural capital that lived peacefully with a multi-ethnic population, including Jews and Christians. Cordoba was one of the great two cities of the Mediterranean. I think it was equal to Constantinople at its heart. We're talking of at least half a million people, an extraordinary powerhouse. You've got an incredibly sophisticated, alive intellectual community. But throughout their history, Muslim empires expended as much energy competing against or fighting each other as they did warring against the infidel. A characteristic of the Muslim Near East in the Middle Ages is the movement between dynasties. Groups fight each other, but they are fighting within the Muslim world as well as against their opponents outside the Muslim world. Of course, this is a characteristic that's shared across the West as well. You find endless examples of countries and families within countries fighting one another, and a group moves to the fore and takes over. While Abdul al-Rahman consolidated his power in Spain, in Morocco, it was Idris II, the son of Idris I, who went on to establish the city of Fez, which remains to this day one of the great strongholds of the Islamic faith. Two thousand Arab families came to settle here in 814, followed by 8,000 Arab families from Spain. Fez is famous for its medieval Medina, with its labyrinth of narrow streets and alleyways. This giant walled city, home to 70,000 people, is the world's largest urban car-free zone, and everything today still needs to be brought in by hand-pulled carts or even donkeys. The heart of the city is its 9th century 
Karawan Mosque, established in 859, which is also the sanctuary for the tomb of Idris II. It contains what is thought to be the oldest university in the world. Over the centuries, the mosque has been encased by the Medina surrounding it. Fès is a ville cosmopolite. It accueilled d'abord les Berbères, les Arabes, les gens qui venaient de Palestine, d'Irak et du nord de l'Arabie, et surtout les, les Andalous. Donc un, un mélange de cultures qui a donné une richesse considérable. Mais il était euh, lié à un réseau euh, d'échanges, non seulement d'échanges économiques, mais d'échanges d'hommes et de biens, d'idées. Donc il y avait des artistes qui venaient, des artisans, des savants qui enseignaient à l'université, euh, des, des militaires, euh, et, et parfois des constructeurs qui faisaient les bâtiments euh, en même temps. After the death of Idris II, a new dynasty came to power and they would found another great city and make it their capital. What is known today as the Pink City was founded in 1062 by a Berber dynasty known as the Almoravids. Their most charismatic leader was Yusuf ben Tashfin. The Almoravids constructed a 20 kilometer, eight meter higher mud wall around the city in 1126, giving a distinct color which survives to this day. been repaired and rebuilt many times in the 900 years since. And they introduced an ingenious underground irrigation system that still supports a vast Palmyrae outside Marrakesh. The Almoravid version of strict Orthodox Islam spread across Morocco and into neighboring Algeria. And at the age of 80, Yusuf ben Tashfin launched a series of daring invasions of the Iberian Peninsula. In terms of a powerful warlord figure, um, Tashfin is the great figure. I mean, he remains um, a Puritan from the desert, um, wearing clothes that were woven by his own family, waging a holy war for 45 years. To protect their newly won territory, the Moors built giant fortress palace complexes known as El Kazabas. Construction of some, like the old El Kazaba at Malaga, had begun more than 200 years earlier during the reign of Cordoban based dynasty of Abdul al Rahman. But the El Maravids embellished the El Kazaba, adding many of the hundred towers that survive to this day. A series of fortified gates take you to the inner sanctum of the palace grounds. The Moors were renowned for their gardens and use of water, delivered by simple but ingenious irrigation methods to create an ambience of peace and tranquility to their surroundings. But the Moors also built more practical structures used for defense only. Further northwest on the banks of the Guadiana River in Merida, where the Romans had built one of the longest bridges ever constructed by the empire. The Moors built this El Kazaba on the site of a previous Visigoth fortress. And in Seville, on the banks of the river Guadalquivir, the Toro de Oro watchtower was constructed in 1221. It's still here today. The Moors' territory stretched as far north as Zaragoza near Barcelona, where they constructed the El Jaferia Palace, which hundreds of years later would be occupied and converted by Spanish monarchs. Many conquests of the Iberian Peninsula were launched from here, 
the modern-day capital of Morocco, Rabat. But right from the start, the battles between Moors and Christians seesawed over the decades, a pattern which would be repeated over the centuries. As early as the 11th century, Moors would return from Spain after military defeats, and in Rabat, they settled here in the Rabat harbour entrance in an area known as the Kasbah of the Weeders. The unique blue and white washed homes of the refugees are still here today. The Almoravids also embellished Fez, in addition to their capital, Marrakesh. Skilled craftsmen were imported from Spain. Countless new buildings and fountains were erected. By 1145, we're told there were 10,000 shops and 785 mosques. But very few monuments from a century of Almoravid rule remain. In Marrakesh, the most significant remaining Almoravid mosque is a small shrine known as the Kuba, now undergoing restorative work. The Almoravid successors, the Almorads, were also Berbers, but when they overthrew the Almoravids in 1147, they plundered and destroyed their legacy, a trend that would be repeated with coming dynasties over the centuries. From their bridgehead cities in Spain, warrior Sultan Yacoub el Mansur won great battles, first in Portugal. Renowned as a great builder of mosques, he then defeated the Christians at Vera and Alarcos in Spain. El Mansur's most famous mosque was the Ketubia here in Marrakesh. Its 70 metre high tower became a prototype of the genre, its influence apparent in Moroccan minarets since the 12th century. The towers are also fully functional, they're not decorative, they're not little finials like a sort of Mameluke um, tower or, the, or Ottoman minarets. They've all got practical ramps, they're all lit with, um, with light wells and they're all used for the muezzin. Often the commander, the sultan, the emir, the caliph himself, climbing to the minaret tower and calling his army together in the mosque. So there's obedience and order, almost a sort of Norman respect for architecture as an expression of state power. The design was also copied in the Moors' Spanish territories. Seville's massive cathedral, the world's largest, is itself a former mosque. Its giant bell tower, the Geralda, used to be a minaret. The tower is 342 feet high and remains one of the most important symbols of the city, as it has been since medieval times. The Almohads used the Ketubia in Marrakesh as a model for the Geralda. The tower's first two-thirds is the former minaret, built between 1184 and 1198, and the upper third, Spanish Renaissance architecture. After Seville was taken by the Christians in 1248, this former mosque was converted into a church. The final third of the tower is today an outstanding example of the Gothic and Baroque architectural styles. quite startling you know, going into the cathedral in Seville. It still has the feeling of having been something else in the past. It was the same artisans, the same architects, the same decorators. They construed the Geralda of Seville, the Kutubia of Marrakech, and the Torre Sainte of Rabat. Voilà, with the same style Almohad, very elegant, but in the same austere parce qu'il exprimait exactement la, les, la conception religieuse de, de, leur, de, de leur dynastie. In Rabat, you find Yacoub El Mansour's great unfinished work. It's known as Hassan's Tower, and it was to be the greatest mosque in Western Islam. El Mansour died when it was half built, and it remains in that state today.
After the death of Al-Mansur, the Almorids were in turn overthrown by the Marinids, who achieved fresh victories in Spain and conquered Algeria and made Fez their capital in 1248. They build the most beautiful things you can see in Morocco and difficult not to fall in love with them, but they're like a Renaissance dynasty in Italy. They live well, they build beautifully, um, but their, their soul is rotten, even if their heart is strong. They were responsible for the Madursas, Islamic boarding schools that can be visited today. Madursa Bo Inania in Fez was built between 1351 and 1357 by Marinid Sultan Bo Inan. It's been impressively restored with elaborate tile work and beautiful cedar lattice screens. Bo Inan also built this Madursa in Meknes, completed a year later in 1358. It's typical of the exquisite interior design common to Marinid monuments. Students 10 to 14 slept in tiny rooms on the first floor. Under the Marinids, many refugees arrived in Fez from Spain as battles with Christian Spaniards intensified. They settled on the other side of the river in a quarter known as El Andalus. Among those arriving were skilled Granada craftsmen whose legacy can still be seen today. Ceramic workshops produce the intricate handmade tiles that decorate so much here and are now made for export. But we know that there was a rich exchange of both Jews, Muslims, um, trading and moving from um, Morocco to Spain the, the whole period. And when we look at, um, at archaeological digs, I'm afraid you can see the ceramic tradition was much finer in Moorish Spain. And, and the weight of the evidence is that Andalusia was the creator, and Morocco, um, and to a certain extent Algeria, was the executor of this artistic genius and added its own Islamic purity. So it's, it's, it's a subtle combination of, as it were, the, the patron uh, as North African, the craftsman Andalusian, and the two of them making something totally exceptional. Copper work is also a proud artisan tradition. As is leather work. Tanneries within the Medina process skins for leather goods. The most famous tannery, Charuwara, is world famous. There were also Jewish refugees escaping persecution in Spain. At one time, a quarter of a million lived here in a specially created mala or Jewish quarter. Their old houses remain, their open balconies looking into the street. When you go to Fez, you see the mela. It's right beside the palace. It's actually within the protection of the palace citadel walls. So the Sultan had his Jews right beside him to do all the things he needed to do. To make metal, to make guns, to make jewelry, to be a sort of banker. All of those things were prescribed either by tradition or by Islam. At that period, there was a Moroccan tradition against mixing metals and working with metals. And they preferred, whenever there was a possible alternative not to involve themselves in um, transmuting gold and silver and working jewelry and it was always kept as um, an aspect of the Jews. Less than a hundred Jews remain, a bygone era symbolized now by the Jewish cemetery where a sea of blindingly white tombs stretch down the hill from the Mela. The Marinid sultans who welcomed the Jews were buried in far grander surroundings on a hilltop overlooking Fez. But the Marinid dynasty grew unpopular, protected by Syrian mercenaries, and their tombs were ransacked and made ruinous long ago. The Marinids lost power because they started losing wars in Spain, and then many ports in Morocco too raising taxes to try to introduce new bronze cannons to keep up with European technology, they became hugely unpopular. They got throttled by, by this double act of trying to raise money and, and trying to win this war um, 
against the Spanish. And emblematically, a bit like this, the French Revolution, people don't talk about it so much in Morocco. In 1465, the last Marinid, Abdul Haq, uh, is toppled in a, in a popularizing in Fez and dragged through the streets by his heels like a goat and have his throat cut um, and his body thrown out um, by the city gates. And that's the sort of emblematic end of this dynasty that didn't cut the mustard. Meanwhile, in southern Spain, or El Andalus, today's Andalusia, the Moors continued building, an architectural legacy still here today. In the winding alleys of the old Jewish quarters, particularly in Cordoba, Seville, and here in Granada, where one of Moorish Spain's most spectacular buildings, the Alhambra Palace, still stands. Work began on the Alhambra fortifications in 889, but the complex evolved over several centuries, with work on its three palaces not completed until the end of the 14th century. The Alhambra was the last surviving Islamic citadel in medieval Spain. It was a huge fortress and palace on top of a hill which took the Castilian army's centuries to conquer. In 1492, the Emirate of Granada was the last bastion of Moorish Spain to fall to the Reconquista, led by the crusading Isabel and Ferdinand. The last Moorish emir, Boabadil, surrendered to the Spanish monarchs on the plain below the fortress. The Alhambra itself was never taken, but the royal standard of the Catholic monarchs soon flew from the watchtower atop the fortress citadel. The Catholic monarchs then moved into what was the most exquisite of buildings that the Moors had created during their 800-year rule. The Alhambra complex is vast, covering 35 acres, and has a number of grand features. The protective El Kazaba, or fortress, at its western end is the oldest part of the complex, and built on an isolated and precipitous headland, making it impossible to take. The rest of the plateau comprises a number of earlier and later Moorish palaces, enclosed by a fortified wall and 13 defense towers. 30 years after their victory, the new Spanish monarch, Charles I, built a giant Renaissance palace in 1526, right in the heart of the complex. It sits uneasily today amongst the Moorish architecture of the Alhambra. The main entrance to the Alhambra was the Gate of Judgment. Built in 1348, with its massive horseshoe-shaped arch, the hand of Fatima, with fingers outstretched against the evil eye, is carved above the entrance. The royal palace complex consists of three main palaces. The oldest is the most modest and was used for business and administrative purposes. The Hall of the Ambassadors is the largest room and was used for welcoming important visitors. The Moors' pleasure gardens and courtyards, with water features as its lifeblood, add to the Alhambra's restful, exotic aura. The entire complex overlooks the old district of El Bazin, where Muslims continued to live for decades after the Reconquista. Soon after the last Moors were overthrown, the Inquisition intensified, and Jews, tolerated under Islam, were driven out too or killed, the victims of a bloody and barbarous witch hunt by inquisitors. Isabel and Ferdinand's lieutenant, Thomas de Torquemida, ran 100,000 trials, burnt 2,000 at the stake, and advised Ferdinand and Isabel to issue the Edict of Expulsion. This led to 100,000 Jews converting to Christianity and another 200,000 who didn't being forced to leave the country. The Inquisition was, was crucial in some ways in trying to uncover the true nature of uh, people's beliefs, 
Uh, and one of the reasons why the Inquisition was founded in the first place was to police the boundaries between these different ethnic populations um, and to ensure that religious conformity and homogeneity um, existed throughout, throughout the kingdoms of Spain. The Alhambra, the most famous of Moorish palaces, may still be here today, but after the Reconquista, inquisitors tried to eradicate Muslim culture too, carrying out mass baptisms, burning Islamic books, and banning the Arabic language. By 1500, about 300,000 Muslims had been baptized and converted under threat of expulsion. But these Moriscos, as they were known, were eventually expelled 100 years later. The Christian victory over the Moors in Spain in 1492 had resulted in the mass exodus from the Iberian Peninsula of both Muslims and Jews. The Reconquista is one of the world's great tragedies, which I'm afraid the West doesn't pay enough attention to. The Muslim people of Spain were given the choice ultimately to convert or um, to flee, to go and settle in the rest of the Mediterranean or on the North African coast. Even though they converted to become Christian, even they were expelled, although they'd been Christians for generations. And then, curiously, then had to convert to being Muslims back in their North African homeland. For more than 100 years, embittered Moriscos, as they were known, were among those who took to the seas off the Iberian Peninsula, pirating European ships and enslaving their crews. The Barbary Corsairs, as they were called, the, the Corsairs of North Africa, of which the Barbarossas were the preeminent example, traumatized the coasts of Spain and Italy. Incessant raiding of villages, capturing of ships, plundering of islands, created a psychological terror in the people of the Christian Mediterranean that it's hard to imagine now. They were very fast, they knew the sea very well, and they could be very, very powerful, controlling the shipping. And of course, they attack the ships, and they get the booties, they get the, uh, the slaves uh, for their ships, and then sold it. It was also holy war. It was payback for the expulsion of the Moorish population from Spain. There was, there was religious revenge there. We know that at their height in the 17th century, they're raiding Iceland, Cornish coast. Even the town of Baltimore in Ireland gets hit by Barbary Corsairs in the night, swooping up and taking captives. Even small fishing boats, three or four family members from a Cornish fishing village would be taken down and made slaves. White slaves were destined for ports like this one in Celle, still here today. It's estimated that over a period of 100 years, 30,000 Europeans were captured and sold into slavery. There were tens of thousands of white slaves in, in North Africa. In fact, a recent historian has calculated there were more British slaves working in North Africa in 1621 than there were colonial settlers in the North American colonies. We know about ambassadors going down to the courts, begging for relief. We know about ransom societies in Europe, raising money by rescuing some of the Barbary Corsairs, who then had to sign a document, putting them on tour with their chains going around all the towns and cities of Europe, raising money for the next lot of, of captives to be released. And famous people like Don Quixote, you know, worked and, and endured slavery. And it was slavery with hard labor. Those walls and mechanisms we see, we know from ambassadorial accounts, were partly made with white slaves. Powerful image. The Morisco raiding party set out from North African ports and reached as far east as Italy, where they attacked shipping along its western coast. It wasn't just European slaves being seized by Moors. 
Moorish slaves were also taken by Europeans and sold in slave markets in port cities like Livorno. This sculpture, known as the Four Moors, shows Ferdinand de' Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, towering over four shackled Moorish slaves. These giant bronze statues, created by Tuscan sculptor Pietro Tacca, a pupil of Giambologna, were erected between 1623 and 1629. The statue of the Duke, the founder of Livorno, who made a name for himself fighting the pirates, was elected 25 years earlier. Diminished of their Spanish territories, the Moorish Empire nevertheless remained a powerful economic force in North Africa in the 17th century. But it was trading goods rather than slaves that made Moorish cities such as Marrakesh wealthy. We forget just how important West African gold was to the ancient economy. It paid for everything. It was like the oil and the gas of our day. For a thousand years, the gold dust extracted from the upper waters of the Niger, panned um, with ostrich feathers, was packed into quills and sent across the Sahara. Trading caravan could do about 10 days in the heat of the, uh, of the Sahara, then it needed to be somewhere in an oasis to recover its strength for a fortnight, both for the men and particularly for the camels. And then they'd be ready for another 10 days and they'd need to have another safe spot. And the camel caravans would be thousands of camels, so this was a great military occupation, and finally arrive at the portals of North Africa, like Sigil Massa in Morocco, um, Gadamis in Tunisia and Libya, and feed this vital gold um, up to North Africa and to the rest of the world. Controlling the gold routes fed all of the great um, state building projects and it meant the Saharan trade routes were terribly important and controlling of the Saharan oasises were absolutely vital, like the ports and the airports of our modern day. And it explains the savagery of which the medieval dynasties attacked each other because actually what they were attacking and what they're trying to control was this vital gold trade route. In the Medina of Marrakesh, one can still find many caravanserais. Nearly 150 still survive, where valuable merchandise was stored and where merchants and traders who brought these cargoes from inland Africa could also stay on the first floor. The great beneficiaries of this lucrative trade were Morocco's new dynastic rulers, the Sarians. They came to power as holy men in southern Morocco in charge of the jihad, trying to get the Portuguese out of all these coastal ports and fortresses they'd established, which they achieve by masterminding a two-generation-long war against the foreign invaders. The Sardians bring everything together into its sort of dazzling culmination of style and grandeur. Overlooked by the Marinids, Marrakesh in the late 16th century enjoyed a renaissance under the new Sardian dynasty. They established a Jewish mella or quarter in 1558, where 6,000 Jews were relocated. Today, with other mellas in Moroccan cities, most Jews have left, and just a small synagogue remains. However, their impact on cultural and commercial life in the city is felt to this day. The Jews in Morocco were very, very influential, partly because they had so many talents. They were very interlinked with government. Things like being ambassadors, traders with foreign powers, Moroccan Muslims saw the Christians, quite rightly, as their enemy, or attacking them. And whenever possible, they would use a Jewish intermediary, both as an ambassador, a spy, a contrabandist, dealing in the early arms trade. It's often forgotten that Protestant England benefited from the secret arms trade with Morocco. And um, the, the interconnection was always a Jewish middleman. The Al-Badi Palace, a 360-room palace, 
commissioned by famous Saudian Sultan Ahmed al-Mansur, was considered a wonder of its time. Featuring sunken gardens and reflective pools, it was decorated in gold, turquoise and crystal. Treasures all plundered by the later Alawite Sultan, the infamous Moulay Ismail, who used them for his own palace in Meknes. Saudian Sultan El Mansur also spared no expense in his glorious mausoleum. Also buried here were 60 members of his family and trusted Jewish advisors. El Mansur died in splendor in 1603, but Moulay Ismail, who had plundered the palace, had the mausoleum walled up as well. It was only discovered by aerial photography nearly 300 years later in 1917. Even today, the tombs are only accessible through a small passageway in a nearby mosque. There are only traces in Marrakesh today of the refined taste of the Saudian artisans, such as in this small Riyadh, where the original features have been painstakingly restored to their amazing colors, an indication of the vibrant decorations for which the Saudians were renowned. Moorish architecture is full of different forms. I mean, the thing to concentrate most, perhaps, is the horseshoe arch. Evolving out of Roman and Byzantine forms, and so it uses brick and stone. Um, the other great detail is a very Mediterranean um, delight in courtyards, courtyard gardens, running water, scent, the flowing in of garden space with, with a house. Another detail of Moorish architecture that everybody notices is um, the dadio-like um, wall levels of zellige tiles, those mosaics, those geometric tiles. And so you have this fusion. You can't put your finger on one identity of Moorish architecture, but if you start combining all of these details and with this great Islamic purity, there's no figurative art, there's no sculptures, there's no wall painting. There's this pure delight in geometric forms and in nature. C'est pour ça le Maroc reste un des, un des grands euh, lieux de la conservation des traditions euh, hispano-mauresques. Donc non seulement c'est de l'art euh, matériel, c'est-à-dire l'architecture, le décor, etc., mais aussi le, la culture immatérielle, comme la, la cuisine, la musique, les savoir-faire et ainsi de suite. Donc euh, le Maroc était, est resté un conservatoire important des traditions euh, arabo-andalouses. Pour ça, on le voit beaucoup dans l'architecture des villes euh, qu'on appelle les villes impériales. Many of these concepts come together in the traditional house or riyadh found in medinas in Moroccan cities today. Toutes les maisons, les riyadh, les, euh, les palais, ils sont structurés euh, de façon introvertie. Donc, euh, le, les meilleurs de ce qu'on peut voir, c'est à l'intérieur. C'est une civilisation qui euh, cache, qui dissimule la richesse. On ne l'exhibe pas. On, cache, on, va une, une, on va une muraille austère avec juste des, des orifices, de, des fenêtres ou, ou, euh, ou des portes un peu décorées, mais pas, pas trop. Et après, on voit tout de suite un patio bien décoré. La façade est intérieure. C'est une civilisation aussi qui, dans son urbanisme, elle, 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 elle fonctionne selon les catégories euh, euh, montrées, cachées. Euh, visible, invisible, interne, externe. When they assumed power, the Alawites, led by Sultan Mullah Ismail, moved the capital from Fez to Meknes. Meknes a été ville impériale grâce à Moulay Ismail. C'était le deuxième souverain alawite, après Moulay Rashid, qui était le premier, le deuxième, c'est Moulay Ismail. Et il ne s'est pas installé à Fès parce qu'il y avait de mauvaises relations avec les gens de Fès. Le nouveau sultan went on to become one of the most enigmatic rulers in the history of Morocco. Moulay Ismail est toujours une figure dazzling. Figure. 
He's bigger than Louis XIV. He is an all-embracing monarch in Morocco. He's pious, he's strong, he's fecund, he's powerful, he's a warlord, he's a builder. Donc, la vie, la vie impériale de Meknes a duré 55 ans. Donc pendant 55 ans, il n'a pas arrêté de construire. Certainly not lacking in ambition, Ismail built 12 grand palaces enclosed by 25 kilometers of walls and ramparts. Modeling himself on Louis XIV, his summer palace was meant to be the equivalent of Versailles. He made sumptuous gardens watered by great reservoirs and built the gate Bab Mansour, said to be the grandest gate in all of Morocco. The inscription above its elaborately carved entrance reads, I am the most beautiful gate in Morocco. I am like the moon in the sky. Property and wealth are written on my front. He's still there when you go to Meknes. The extraordinary extent of walls, fortresses, broken palaces, all have got one crater, Muli Ishmael. You begin, as you stagger around these extraordinary extent of ruins, to, to wonder about the nature of this man, this 17th century emperor. So what do the ruins of Meknes tell us about Mule Ismail? He was a flamboyant character. He fathered hundreds of boys, um, more than hundreds of, of daughters. He had very charismatic wives. He had a representative beauty from each of the races of the world. He had a, an English girl captured by the Corsairs as one wife. He had a very powerful black um, wife who was sort of... the sort of dowager queen of, of the whole empire. And on the back of it, he built up this passionately loyal slave army at its height of 150,000 black Moroccans who essentially came from the Saharan provinces and deep down in West Africa and were bred and were married um, uh, as page boys and page girls by the emperor themselves to breed children who would serve like a Janissary um, guard regiment um, for Morocco. To support his vast army, Ismail built huge reservoirs which watered both the city and the massive stables, which could house 12,000 cavalry horses. The animals were waited on hand and foot, with a groom and a slave for each horse, to ensure that all their needs were met. Today the site is overrun by stray cats. When he died, many of Ismail's grand projects were either incomplete or fell into ruins. But his legacy remains undiminished. Et il a pas arrêté de parcourir le territoire pour pacifier et aussi pour libérer beaucoup de, de villes qui, qui ont été conquises par les Espagnols et les Portugais. Donc, à, 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 à cette époque, euh, le, les côtes marocaines étaient complètement euh, occupées par les but the Grand Square where public executions took place and where Ismail expected an army of 150,000 black slave soldiers from Sudan is now the thriving heart of the old city. And within the grounds of one of his royal palaces, one of his Alawite descendants, the last king, Hassan II, a mad keen golfer built a golf course enclosed by Ismail's magnificent walls. Hassan II died in 2003 and is buried in this magnificent tomb here in Rabat next to his father, Muhammad V, who was the last Sultan of Morocco before the title was changed to king in 1957. The mausoleum is situated adjacent to Hassan's tower, the great unfinished monument of Sultan El Mansur. Hassan's son, Muhammad VI, is now on the throne. Like other Alawite sultans, he claims descent from the Prophet. 
As such, he's both the country's spiritual leader and head of state. His family remains one of the world's most wealthy. Moroccan royal family is part of this continuous dynastic story of, of Morocco where we need a strong central power to hold all the different provinces together. Particularly when Morocco looks at what happened to Algeria, the 10 year civil war, what happened after the strong man in Libya, Gaddafi, collapsed and Libya imploded, what happened in Syria. And so although Morocco could be freer if you compare it to its northern neighbors, to France and Spain, it's also an extraordinary success story if looking in its own hinterland. And Morocco has been evolving continuously towards a total democratic horizon. It's not there yet. Hassan II modernized the country, adopting a market-based economy where tourism was developed and encouraged. His son, Mohammed VI, even built a surf club here in Rabat. But the royal family's grip on power remains undiminished. They're not always loved, except when Moroccans look at the rest of the world and say, we do need a strong central power. The legacy of the Moors lives on, both here in Morocco and in the great buildings they left behind in Spain and beyond. This remains one of the world's most enduring dynastic civilizations.